Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rosa Lyon. I work as a journalist for the Austrian um, broadcasting as a reporter and a host for the news show Zeitung Bild. I'm glad you all made it here and thankful that technology makes an event like this possible in the midst of a pandemic. Welcome to the keynote session, Green New Deal. Our keynote speaker is an economist, a political thinker, an advisor, and I think it's safe to say she's an activist. She's warned the world of the coming first world debt crisis. That's the name of her book, and it came out in the year 2006. It took the world another two years to realize Anne Pettifor was right. Now she's warning us again, and this time she's in good company, and she's presenting a solution to the problem. It's called the Green New Deal. And again, she wrote a book called The Case for the Green New Deal. And Pettifer has advised the Democratic representative uh, for New York's 14th Congressional District, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And Pettifer once called herself the girl that said, he has no clothes on in the story of the emperor's new clothes. She will present to us how she reimagines the economy, starting with the financial system. She includes social welfare as well as climate protection. The Green New Deal wants a total decarbonization and a commitment to an economy based on fairness and social justice. And Pettifer's speech will last for about 30 minutes and will be a wonderful basis to start a discussion afterwards. And Petifer, the floor is all yours. Good afternoon. Um, can you hear me, everyone? Can you hear me? Yeah? Can everybody hear what I'm saying? Right. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Hi. Um, it's been a little bit nerve wracking uh, getting the technology right. I think I have a firewall that's being particularly difficult today. So I apologize for that. Thank you very much, Rosa, for that introduction. And yes, I do regard myself as the who watched the emperor, in that case, the economics profession, pretend that actually uh, the system, the global system was stable and was unlikely uh, to face economic failure and they were terribly wrong. Uh, and I wrote my book because I was so worried about my colleagues and my friends, my family who were all taking out mortgages and so on when we knew there was a crisis impending. So here we are um, and quite recently we, uh, we we, I published a book, The Case for the Green New Deal, in which I warned also that the international system is very rigid and is unlikely to change, but that it would be forced to change by the coming of, a, of what I called a tremendous shock. And sure enough, uh, and something I did not predict at all, uh, the global economy was hit by the pandemic in March of this year, or actually in December, January of this year. So that shock is something that's waking us up to future potential threats of pandemics, uh, but above all to the threats that are posed by climate breakdown. I uh, don't like to use the term climate change. I think we ought to be talking about climate breakdown. So let me begin at the beginning. What is the Green New Deal, right? First of all, I want to say that the Green New Deal uh, Max, if you could move along. The, the Green New Deal is cathedral thinking. Um, next slide. Uh, to save the planet. And I got the term cathedral thinking from this young woman, who uh, Greta Thunberg, who said once that we've got to engage in cathedral thinking if we want to transform the system and the planet. And that means we must lay the foundation while we may not know exactly how to build the ceiling. And so the Green New Deal is a way of thinking about this new system that we have to, to uh, transform. The, the Green New Deal, above all else, next slide, is system change. It's not climate change. 
It's about arguing that what we need is to change the system and in particular the economic system. Next slide. The argument that the finance, the economy and the ecosystem are all tightly bound together. Um, but it is a system, next slide, with the internationalized finance sector effectively in control, exercising private authority over the global economy. And by that I mean private capital markets effectively dictate policy. Next slide. And if you want to know what that means, I refer you to Alan Greenspan and something that he said um, before the crisis, namely that globalization means that thanks to globalization, policy decisions in the United States have been largely replaced by global market forces. National security aside, it hardly makes any different difference who will be the next president. The world is governed by market forces. And that I want to argue is the problem. Uh, and we've seen that problem most uh, at its most extreme during the uh, pandemic, when market forces dictated that capital should flood out of poor countries and towards the United States to strengthen the dollar and weaken the currencies of all those emerging markets having to deal with a health crisis. That was determined by market forces, not by governments, not by democratic governments, not by policy, but by the, the decision of markets as to what they should do. So the Green New Deal, next slide, requires that we transform the international system, the system of globalization, so that it's no longer governed by markets. Next slide, slide please. But that instead, we have public authority over what I call the giant global spigot of mainly unregulated credit creation. Um, credit creation is an effectively effortless activity. It is the making of a promise to pay. That's all that credit is. Credo, I believe, you will pay, right? And in that sense, credit is a wonderful thing. It enables us to promise to pay in the future and therefore to uh, undertake transactions in the present. And so it's, a, it's, it's, if you like, a social construct, a human invention that has developed over many centuries, but it's very valuable. It enables us to do business with each other, to undertake transactions. But managing credit is terribly important. If we make too many promises, if we make promises beyond the capacity of the economy or indeed of the ecosystem to deliver on those promises, we get into deep trouble. And right now, the spigot of credit creation is unregulated. It's left entirely up to the creators of credit to decide how much and to whom to lend. And above all, and most importantly, at what price to lend. That power is an extraordinary power. It has led to a huge expansion of credit or effectively debt. Next slide, please. And credit fuels consumption. We all know that without a credit card, you can't go shopping on Amazon or, or eBay, right? The credit card is the thing that enables uh, consumption to take place and it fuels consumption. Um, I'm old enough to remember the days before credit cards when it was actually quite hard uh, to make a promise and to get a, a, to make a transaction because you had to show your show the money. When credit cards became prolific, became widespread, and banks started issuing them recklessly, if you like, to anyone who wanted one effectively, people then were given the power to to go shopping and to consume further. And that, of course, also the next slide fuels production, and next slide that in turn fuels greenhouse gas emissions. This is, uh, this is straightforward and we all understand this. But also, next slide, it, ref it, it fuels something called rent seeking. Making money from credit is much easier than making money from constructing something, from building something, from making something new, from, from creativity, right? It is a bank can uh, make credit almost without effort. Uh, in the real world, in the real economy, capitalists have to engage on the one hand with the land and on the other hand with labor if they want to construct a factory, uh, build a farm and so on and so forth. 
but a, a, a creditor, a banker, a financier, a shadow banker, all they have to do is to construct a contract and a promise to pay and transfer the sum to the account of the borrower. This kind of effortless activity makes it far more profitable to earn rent, if you like, or interest from the creation of credit or from the availability of an asset than it is from creating new assets. And so we live in a, under a global economy that in which rent-seeking, rentierism, is predominant. The makers are no longer dominant in the capitalist economy. Instead, it's the takers that are dominant. Next slide. So for me, money, and this is Bill McKibben saying this, is the oxygen on which the fire of global warming burns. Next slide. Because as he explained, he, the key to disrupting the flow of carbon into the atmosphere may lie in disrupting the flow of money to coal and oil gas. And he goes on to explain that, next slide, J.P. Morgan Chase, America's largest bank and the world's most valuable by market capitalization, in the three years after the Paris Agreement was signed, next slide, reportedly committed $196 billion in financing to the fossil fuel industry, much of it to fund extreme new ventures, ultra deep sea drilling, Arctic oil extraction, and so on. Next slide. And the next slide. In each of those years, Exxon Mobil, by contrast, spent less than $3 billion on oil extraction research and development. So we can see here that the oil companies are not are not funneling as much money into oil extraction as the banks are funneling into fossil fuels. So if we if we start with the the, the spigot uh, first, we can perhaps manage the flow of money to fossil fuels. Although that, of course, is going to change as well as they become distressed assets. We know also. Next slide, please. That the private sector prefers to provide finance for fossil fuels than it does for renewables. So in 2018, of the $1.8 trillion invested in all aspects of the energy sector, only 300 billion went into renewables. The bulk of the rest was for fossil fuels. Um, and the reason for this next slide is straightforward. Few investments in renewable projects can make returns of more than five to 8%. Typical investments in oil and gas projects, where the barriers to entry are much higher, earn returns of 15% or more. So if an investor, a speculator, wants to make a quick buck, investing in renewables is not as half as profitable as, profitable as investing in fossil fuels. We have to change that. So the Green New Deal, next slide, demands system, structural system change to the system. And in, in that sense, what makes the Green New Deal different is that we're not just about behavioral community or technological change. That, that's much and widely discussed. We are about structural change to permit public investment aimed at renewables, etc. Next slide. So the New Deal and then the Green New Deal originates with Keynes's 1919 scheme for the rehab next slide please for for the rehabilitation of european credit and for financing relief in construction after the first world war and for me that it may seem odd to choose this but that moment in history for me is so relevant to europe today and so relevant to what we're trying to do europe was in ruins right and the leaders of the world were arguing about how much Germany had to pay, how much the had Austria had to pay the Allies, and so on. And Keynes understood that these countries needed money to recover. That he also understood that for the whole of the world to recover, Europe had to recover. And that for Europe to recover, it needed finance, but it needed for affordable finance. And Wall Street and the City of London we're not going to provide Europe with that affordable finance. So he developed a plan, and it was for the redesign effectively of the international financial system as it was then, which was under the gold standard. 
He wanted to move from the gold standard, which, like today, enabled especially the British banks, the City of London banks, to exercise private authority over the international financial system. And instead, he wanted to propose that we issued finance with the backing of public authority. Next slide, please. So his plan was that Germany would issue bonds. And, and this is so relevant to the debate about safe assets and about a European safe asset right now. Germany would issue bonds to the raise about a billion pounds, at that time a lot of money. The bonds would be different from bonds issued to banks by banks. They would have priority over all other German obligations. And to give them power, to give them the power to raise finance, they would be guaranteed jointly and severally by the United States, Britain and France, who would guarantee 20% each, essentially. So in other words, he was saying, don't look to Wall Street. You look to the states, these states. The United States is powerful and rich and solid. Britain, for all its weaknesses after the war, is still a sound uh, economy. And France, these are institutions, these are government states that can provide guarantees into the future for these loans. Unfortunately, uh, he saw this as being uh, acceptable as payment between allied governments and so on. So the French could use the bonds to pay debts to the British and the British could use them to pay debts to the Americans and so on. But next slide. But the, unfortunately, uh, he, made, he delivered his plan to the world leaders. And at the time, President Wilson, the American president, was being advised, being advised by this man, whose name was Thomas Lamont, and who was the chief executive of J.P. Morgan. And he immediately recognized the threat to the private banking system posed by Keynes's idea. So he uh, subverted the idea. He persuaded Wilson to reject Keynes's proposal. Now, Keynes's proposal, you know, nobody had really thought in, this term, in these terms before. So it was quite a big step for nations to take. But if it had worked, it would have provided the finance for Europe, not just Germany, to recover. Anyway, um, that was abandoned, and we know what the consequence was. The consequence was that Europe had to look to Wall Street and to the City of London for finance. They were willing to offer loans at very high rates of interest, but you know that effect eventually became unaffordable. And we then saw the continuation of the private authority over the international financial system, which led, as you know, to the 1929 crash, to the rise of fascism and to a Second World War. The really good news is that in 1933, Keynes's grand scheme that he first thought up in, uh, in Paris in 1990 was adopted by none other than President Roosevelt, essentially. And what's very striking is people forget this bit of the history, but on the night of his inauguration, after he'd made his speech, he went back to the White House and he announced that the United States was going to dismantle the gold standards. That night, he said to his advisors, I want the banks to hand over their gold tonight, if not tomorrow. And they said, unfortunately, you can't do that because tomorrow is a holy day. You'll have to do it on Monday. So he said, fine, let's close the banks on Monday. And they hand over their gold. And he makes an announcement to the American people, say, if you're holding gold, please give it to the Treasury. We're no longer on the gold standard. In, in future the government, the an, a democratically elected and very popular government at the time, will manage the financial system, will manage the economy, not Wall Street. And in that sense, what he did was he placed government, not Wall Street, in the driving seat of the economy. And I, I tried to find a picture of him, a photo of him in the driving seat, but of course he was disabled and he couldn't drive a car. But I did find this image of him in a car. To, in, uh, to demonstrate the point. So, of course, money was used for creating jobs, next picture, and for providing work across. But above all, it was used for transforming the Dust Bowl, the ecological crisis of 1933. Uh, Roosevelt's administration planted, we think, three, some people argue, four billion trees to deal with the devastating soil erosion that had expanded across many states in the United States. So 
the Green New Deal, let's move along to the next, to the spigot slide. So the Green New Deal is about achieving the same transformation again that Roosevelt achieved. Next slide, please. Um, namely, to manage the spigot that drives the hyper-globalization juggernaut. Um, Max, can you move to the next slide, please? Yeah. More, more, further on, further on. Move along. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. And now the next slide. So what I am arguing, what we in the Green New Deal are arguing for, next slide, is for greater public authority and management of the spigot of global credit. Now, by public authority and management, I mean regulation, right? And to some and to many, this is regarded as incredibly radical and almost impossible to achieve. But it's actually perfectly sensible. Namely, we should regulate credit creation. Uh, I don't want to, I can't, haven't got time to go into this in enough depth. But after the great financial crisis, the provision of credit by banks, regulated banks, diminished. And the banking sector moved into what the Bank for International Settlements calls the shadow banking sector. And the shadow banking sector today generates more credit than the high street banking sector. You know, the banks that we know about uh, on a daily and that we deal with on a daily basis are now irrelevant essentially to the international financial system. There is now a, a shadow banking sector. And believe it or not, that shadow banking sector is endorsed and, and supported and maintained to a large extent by the activities of our public central banks. So next slide please so we want a globally coordinated reflation strategy with a focus on the structural transformation and on environmental recovery led by we argue the public sector and the reason why it has to be led by the public sector is that the scale of investment needed to transform our energy transport and land use systems is such that the private sector and just as in 1919 doesn't have the resources for that transformation. And if they do have the resources, there is money out there, there is a capacity to create credit. They will demand rates of return and conditions on those loans, which would make both the economic system, but also the environmental system worse. In other words, we'd have to strip more forests and fish more seas to pay back the debts and the high rates of interest demanded by the private finance sector for financing this transformation and that's not affordable either in economic terms or ecological terms so we want such a thing so the principles of the green new deal economy if i can quickly take us through this um this is a big story i'm telling you in a very short time so the principles are as follows first of all next slide is that should it be a steady state economy we have to end the delusion of infinite expansion what economists call growth. We cannot go on expanding. Uh, we cannot go on expanding investment, exploitation of the Earth's assets, and indeed even of labor uh, to the extent that we do today. We have to end the delusion of infinite expansion. So that's a principle. And the second principle is that any uh, Green New Deal economy has to be based on two budgets the nation's economic budget on the one hand, nested within its carbon budget. And so what we need to do is to be able to measure and to assess an, a country's carbon budget and to ensure that, that it lives within those uh, carbon, uh, the, that budget. Uh, here in Britain, the city of Manchester has a carbon budget. Uh, devised by the Tyndall Centre, which is one of our high levels of expertise in climate science. And Professor Kevin Anderson at the Tyndall Centre has set for Manchester a carbon budget and, and argued with the mayor and, 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 and persuaded the mayor that Manchester has to learn to live within that budget. Now, that calculating that is complicated and, and difficult. And living within it is going to be even more complicated. But at least Manchester is beginning to think 
of what must be done for a sustainable economy that's called Manchester. You know, they're going to have to move to cycling and away from cars, maybe electric cars. They're going to have to transform their housing uh, stock and so on and so forth. But now they know what the limits are to what they can and do. So we need a, a double-based e uh, economy. We need an con economy that, in my view, and this is slightly controversial, should largely based, be based on self-sufficiency. Uh, here in England, we depend on Kenyans in far-off countries to drain their water tables, to exploit their labor at low wages, and to grow green beans for us, not just once, uh, once a season, but every day of the year. And then we expect it to be flown to, to London so that we can eat green beans 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Right Now, this is controversial because what happens to the Kenyan economy if they're no longer growing their green beans for us? And I haven't time to go into that. But as someone who comes from Africa, I think it's incredibly important that Kenya too should be allowed a degree of self-sufficiency and if she needs help, that international coordination and co cooperation should be fundamental to, to how we manage our relationships with, with low-income countries. Secondly, the Green New Deal is a labor-intensive economy where we understand we have to substitute labor for fossil fuels. You know, we have to get off our, out of our motor cars and onto bicycles. We have to learn to grow our own food instead of flying it around the world, flying it from different parts of the world and so on. That requires more labor than we currently use. Uh, and that, again, is a big, a big ask. And I also, I'm a mixed market person, although I want to see the state intervene and undertake big works. I understand that, of course, we'll carry on with the private sector uh, undertaking certain areas of work. Another, next slide, another one of the key principles of the Green New Deal is that our investment should be in limited needs. And that should be prioritized, not limitless wants, not simply, I want this, I desire this, I want it instantly. Please, Amazon, deliver it to me tomorrow or today, right? Um, and I want whatever I want, and I'm going to go and go after and get it. No, we're going to have to transform our economy to address limited needs. And we know what those needs are. Let's move to the next slide. Um, they, 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 they're simply basic and they're going to be incredibly important. If you live in Bangladesh right now, or if you wherever there is a hot spot, climate hot spot right now, you know what's really important. What's really important is survival, adequate nutrition, food and water, health. We know that's truly important. Physical security, economic security, housing, safe work environment, security in childhood, significant primary relationships, basic education, freedom from oppression. These are our limited needs, and these should be addressed and prioritized over our unlimited wants, we argue in the Green New Deal. Then the question, the big question comes, how to pay for all this? You know, how do we pay for all this? I want to argue that that's not complicated. And I think the pandemic, has demonstrated that in you know a year ago, and in Britain, of course, this was a particularly notorious issue, the government walked around saying there is no money. Theresa May fought a general election campaign in which there was a public confrontation with a nurse and her, between her and a nurse, when she said to the nurse, I'm sorry, there is no money to pay to increase your salaries or to, to expand the health service. And this story, there is no money, you know, was, was part of the public discourse. No more. No more. COVID-19 has changed that dramatically. As we've seen, uh, the central banks and governments generate the finance needed to tackle this shock. So there are only two sources of finance. Credit. When you make credit available, which is then used for investment and expenditure, that in turn generates income, and the income in turn generates savings. Savings are a consequence of credit. The world starts first with credit and then 
Only after investment do we gather savings or a surplus, right? And you know this from your own experience. You know, when you take a job, you embark on a job, your employer has probably raised the finance to create, create the job. You work for a month. At the end of the month, you're paid. And when you're paid, you have income. Work generates income. But simultaneously, you pay taxes. And the taxes go to the government, especially if the government helped to pay for the financing of your job. Right. So tax revenues also are the consequence of credit financed public and private investment. When uh, Britain is now busy, for example, building a new railway line, HS2, the civil servants don't build the railway line. It's been built by the construction sector. The government invests the money. And the consequence of that is that the private sector will invest in, for example, the machinery needed to do a contract with the government to build. And those investments and that expenditure generates, uh, generates income. Uh, but above all, what it does for the government, especially if people are employed on that railway line, the high level of employment on that railway line generates tax revenues to help pay for the initial investment, both tax revenues from the private finance employed persons and the publicly employed persons. So the, the money that they pay at the end of the month goes to the government, but they may go shopping, VAT goes to the government, they may have to pay tariffs on goods, they import, that money goes to the government and so on. There's lots of ways in which the government collects revenues, but only after income has been generated by, for example, taxpayers. So in a monetary econ economy, savings, next slide, savings originate as credit. And in a monetary economy, unlike a barter economy, society is no longer dependent on those that have hoarded savings, surpluses for finance and credit. You know, the, the, the lord of the manor that lives at the top of the hill and that has been you know, exploiting and stealing and robbing and so on, and has a massive surplus in the vault of his castle, you no longer have to go and beg him for money. Under a monetary system, you go and meet the bank manager and the bank manager assesses your uh, application for a loan and does it on a way in a way that is both uh, democratic and fair. So society is no longer dependent on those with savings, capitalists. It's not no, as we've seen. You know, in the pandemic, uh, it was possible for the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, and even the ECB to generate new uh, liquidity, new, new new credit, if you like, um, uh, without having to use barter, essentially, so or to draw on other savings. So in the monetary uh, economy, savings are not needed for investment. The central bank can provide credit at the macro level to clients in exchange for a contract or collateral and interest. And private banks provide credit at a micro level, if you like, in exchange for a contract. I promise to pay collateral. I put up this collateral to, to back up my, my promise. And I agree to pay this rate of interest. That's how money is created. The bank then enters numbers into a computer and transfers it digitally into your bank account and you may never ever touch it it's never tan it doesn't necessarily have to be in tan tangible and as we know today uh, we walk into a coffee shop and wave a card at a machine and put the card back into our pockets you know that money is not tangible we don't see it but it represents our promise to pay and the, our contract to honor those promises so shadow banks today, as I said earlier, provide credit and capital in exchange for a contract, collateral, safe assets and haircuts. They operate a little bit, uh, you know, they like a pawn shop, really. Uh, give me uh, give me some an asset you may hold and I'll give you some cash because I'm a pension fund or an, ax or an insurance company and I've got lots of cash. You offer me a, uh, some collateral, perhaps a government bond and I will give you cash. So now the shadow banking system is actually providing credit to the world. So that, that is one source of it. Now we know there's, our problem at the moment is that there's masses of credit in the economy. Uh, let's move along, uh, please, Max. Um, so uh, 
to this at the level of the state and um, move along. We know, for example, that uh, central bank balance sheets have expanded massively uh, since the crisis um, and have, mass you know, they've issued huge amounts of credit, if you like, loans, uh, guarantees, uh, other forms. And, and it always takes the form of credit, it always takes the exchange. You know, some of the worst banks in the world don't just get free money, don't the, the central bank doesn't simply print money. It demands collateral in exchange for liquidity, in exchange for entering numbers into a computer and transferring it to an account. But we've seen the central bank's capacity to do that rise massively in this crisis. So let's move to the next slide. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, the, the federal, the, the, the other thing that, of course, the central banks have done is to use their power over the bank interest rate to lower interest rates dramatically across the board. We've seen that happen. Next slide, please. Um, and, and central banks have accumulated large sums of collateral or assets, extraordinarily high levels of collateral or assets over this period. Next slide, please. Um, and as we've seen, we can see on this slide, the two peaks at which uh, total assets were issued, uh, were, were exchanged with central banks in the 2007, 8, 9 crisis and again in 2020. It's bigger in 2020 than it was in 2008, telling you something about the capacity of central banks to finance uh, recovery. Next slide, please. So I want to go on to just show you that total credit to the non-financial sector today, according to the Bank for International Settlements, is something like $183 trillion. Now, that is an awful lot of money, especially re relevant to real income, to the, to, the, to the world's GDP. I very much doubt that all of that debt will be repaid because it far exceeds the capacity of the economy. To, um, to repay, which is why the crisis we face at the moment in the northern economies is a crisis of corporate debt. That's the biggest crisis. In the south, the problem is sovereign debt, but in the north, the problem is corporate debt. And the shadow banking sector alone, according to the Financial Stability Board, manages something like $185 trillion of credit. Next slide. Um, and according to the FSB, there's something like $377 trillion of credit out there. So there is just no shortage of money. In fact, there's a huge excess of money, uh, of credit issued. This is the spigot. This is the spigot that has issued very large sums. Let's move quickly. Then in addition to that, there are savings. Am I, am, am I, is, is this still okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. In addition to that, next slide, please, there are savings. We know that, for example, pension funds have huge uh, supplies of savings. We know that um, the assets under management by insurance companies is huge, $4 trillion at least, and so on. So there's no shortage of finance. The question is, where does the money go to? The real shortage is the shortage of projects and plans for the 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 transformation of the economy and the ecosystem and that's what we should be fake, fa focusing on at the moment i'm going to stop at this point because i feel i've covered an awful lot of ground and there'll be questions i'm sure thank you very much so and we will plunge into discussion straight away we would like you to participate in the discussion as well so please log into twitter or uh into the uh stage chat and not the um, uh, event chat um, of the, I don't know what the um, software is that you're logged in with this conference. Hop in, okay, hop in, thank you. Um, and if you do it on Twitter, then do it with the hashtag IST2020. And if you want to participate in the photo contest, then do that with hashtag contest. Okay, so. Uh, Sigrid Stagel will also participate. She's VU professor. She's a professor at the VU, even though she's not physically here with us. She's the founder of the Institute and department head of the Department of Socioeconomics, 
also co-director of the Competence Center STAR, Sustainable Transformation and Responsibility, and research group leader. And here with me today are Werner Ratzer and Matthias Weber. I hope they're going to show up in a minute when <laughs> we're here. Werner Ratzer is the director of the Austrian Foundation for Development Research. He holds a PhD in economics, served as advisor to the Austrian government on development finance, and has been a member of the Austrian delegation to the WTO and UN conferences. Matthias Weber is head of the Center of Innovation Systems and Policy at the Austrian Institute of Technologies. He's an engineer, political <coughs> scientist, and an economist, and he's visiting professor at the Université, Université Gustave Eiffel. Uh, yes, and from these three angles, a socio-economic and environmental perspective of Sigrid Stagel, the social and international dimension of Werner Ratzer, and the innovation angle of Matthias Weber, we would like to get some statements of the three of you of three minutes each. Please, Sigrid Stagel, would you start? Thank you very much. With pleasure. Sorry, I can't be with you in Vienna, but uh, thank uh, you very much, Anne Patrick. We can only thank hear you. you. Okay. Yes. Is it, can Can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much for your very insightful presentation, and of course for the book uh, prior to this. Um, uh, not surprisingly, there are many points that uh, I completely share with your big story yes, we um, yes. that you talked about and um, that we need to go beyond just the behavioral, the community, a technology change, but really towards structural change. Yeah. And um, uh, also the accounting for the, the biophysical limits, uh, although you don't call it like that, but uh, your examples on the carbon budget with, with Manchester and other places. Uh, so we're moving along there to um, uh, install institutions uh, that um, make these biophysical uh, limits clear. Um, what is uh, still missing in, in the modeling uh, even further uh, is the, uh, although you mentioned the, um, the tight link, uh, the connectedness of the economy, finance, climate and ecosystems, um, but uh, the ecosystems element um, is still very sketchy. Um, and we have been starkly reminded of this uh, in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, because of course we had viruses of this sort before, uh, but it's pure chance of what characteristics they have. And I think we need, need to become much more aware of this. And that this has also implications for economic modeling, carbon budgets, important step forward, of course, but then also go beyond that and account for the ecosystems in a much more sophisticated way and link them up uh, in the modeling as well as they are in the real world. Um, so. Um, so that was my first point on, on the role of the biophysical sphere uh, in which the economy and society are, of course, embedded. Um, the second point, I fully agree with you on your take in, in the book uh, to uh, that the degrowth was uh, or is an important social movement to highlight uh, the problem uh, of growth, but maybe we shouldn't call it degrowth anymore of where we are moving towards, where we are aiming for, towards. Otherwise, we'll keep repeating uh, that uh, paradigm. Uh, yeah, but yeah. rather, we should discuss what else could we call it? The solidarity economy or uh, public purpose economy? And and uh, what should the con concept that, that uh, replaces uh, this very strong philosophical steps that we are making uh, from uh, utility maximization, although that is, of course, in, in new classical economics, a very narrow term, um, then to uh, uh, consumption possibilities. And that, that is equated. And consumption possibilities means uh, income. And there we are. We are in the growth paradigm. But what else um, should we base economic thinking on? You mentioned needs, Ian Goff's uh, um, important work um, on, on needs, and also that, well, there are, there are universal needs, uh, but there may be culturally determined satisfiers, which may vary between uh, societies. Yeah? So that, that's probably an avenue or well-being, uh, different dimensions of well-being uh, or the capability approach. So the literature has a lot to offer. Uh, and I think we need a much wider discussion on, um, on the productivity of these alternative concepts so that we're moving beyond what we don't want, but rather discuss what we do want. 
Um, and the third point I would like to make is, and that is a bit um, uh, maybe uh, countering uh, your proposition that um, um, policy decisions have been largely replaced by market forces. Um, as a first insight, um, uh, yes, of course. Uh, but then what do we mean by markets? Uh, I'm an institutional economist and uh, with Geoffrey Hodgson, I would uh, argue that um, uh, markets are sets of institutions. So they are not devoid of political decisions, but rather they are decisions of the past that we have built uh, sort of market forces off. And uh, therefore, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge the vested interests and the power relations uh, that are built into our market systems and not see them as either or. Uh, but rather um, political decisions have led to the market forces that we have at the moment. And we need different types of market forces, um, maybe more community-based, uh, of course, uh, acknowledging biophysical boundaries, the climate crisis, as well as the ecosystems. Um, so in that sense, and I found your point that cr uh, credit regulation uh, is considered as radical. Uh, I find that very telling um, because, I mean, why, why not, of course? Yeah. Um, it's a big story on the one hand, which I fully agree with, very interesting uh, insights uh, that, that you gave. And then, of course, there's a big message uh, from, from COVID-19. And um, that includes that um, the creation of, uh, of, of money for investment, of course, for addressing a crisis is there if needed, if the crisis is, is considered as a real crisis. And this tells us what politicians have not, what, that co politicians have not considered the climate crisis as a real crisis, um, because there was nothing of the sort of the, the mobilization of what we have seen with COVID now. So uh, I think we need to take that momentum and demand that also for the climate crisis. And um, a more um, minor point is also that I found it interesting that suddenly we were talking about essential services and non-essential services and essential um, um, uh, um, uh, shops that were allowed to open and non-essential shops. Oh, where does that distinction suddenly come from? Of course, really important. Uh, so yes, we can distinguish between what is essential and what is not essential. And I think that can be useful for the socio-ecological transformation that we need. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I think it was a very interesting uh, presentation by Anne Petifor, and um, I certainly do agree with her um, major analysis of the financial system and the, um, uh, the problems and the deficits that we've seen over the last 40 years with the increasingly globalized financial system that we've experienced. And her major point in that connection, which is that um, we have the money we need to implement the Green New Deal or other um, necessary social uh, investment is certainly true. And we've seen over the last 10 years, for example, that central banks have, as um, Anne already highlighted, have, that central banks have um, expanded the monetary base. We've seen over the last three months during the corona crisis that governments finally abandoned austerity policies and set up large-scale reconstruction uh, programs. So money is not scarce, that's, that's for sure. Um, and the, the major consequence from that is that uh, money, uh, or, the, the, or the major challenge, so to say, is that money needs to be allocated to a socially purposeful investment. And I think that is the major challenge that we face now. Um, and that is perhaps uh, an aspect that Anne could have elaborated a little bit more because I think she private sector to contribute to that socio-ecological transformation. So I think uh, it's not just the amount of money that is uh, the issue here, but it's the second issue that is related to that um, relates to the question of how you bring that money, of how you allocate that money to socially purposeful investment. And for that purpose, I think you need a, a larger and more powerful system of not-for-profit and public investment banks. I think that is something that is pivotal uh, to, that, uh, to that issue. It has to some extent been discussed or taken up uh, in the European Green Deal proposals with the um, importance attached to the European Investment Bank. But I think there needs to be um, a more thorough discussion of the role of communal banks, not-for-profit banks and public investment banks. Um, so that would be my, my, my only remark in that respect, that uh, it's not just about 
the amount of money is also about how you bring the money to the right purpose uh, in terms of uh, investment. A second point that I would like to make uh, relates to the, the social dimension of the Green New Deal. Um, in the book, um, certainly I would agree that a, a major challenge here and also role for the government and the state is to provide something like an employer of last resort function, which is certainly preferable from my point of view to um, a universal basic income program. And here I agree with, with N. Petty Ford. Uh, but I think that in the practical political proposals that we've seen, uh, particularly in the European Green Deal proposals, the whole issue of the, the so-called just transition um, is, is to some extent underdeveloped. I mean, the just transition fund that has been proposed by the European Commission falls, in my view, far short of what is really needed, yeah. um, particularly given a background of 40 years of neoliberal precarization uh, of large strata of the workforce. So given the existential insecurities that large uh, strata of the population have experienced over the, over the last decades, I think in terms of the political purchase of any Green New Deal proposals, um, above um, any, everything else, I think the communication uh, must be uh, that the Green New Deal is a program for a better life, a program that brings jobs, and employment, um, and is a program that also promotes social equality. Um, so I think that is a crucial political issue um, that needs to be um, kind of put in front in terms of communicating the Green New Deal to the citizenry. Um, and I think that the European Green Deal falls far short of that challenge um, and is very much um, you know, framed in technocratic terms. Uh, it is also framed in some, something like an ethics of, of, of responsibility which is fine, but given, as I said, 40, four decades of neoliberal precarization of large strata of the population, I think the social dimension uh, needs um, conceptually to be more elaborated and also in terms of um, the public communication of any Green New Deal proposal needs to be uh, put center stage. The third um, and final issue um, that I would take up with respect to the Green New Deal proposals, um, both of N. Petty Four, but also the, the European Green Deal, relates to the international dimension. Um, Anne has rightly referred to uh, the work of John Maynard Keynes in terms of uh, setting up an international clear clearing union, um, setting up an international reserve currency, um, and and the uh, the problems uh, and the failure that he had to uh, experience during the Bretton Woods Conference. But I think that's just one part of the story. When we think of, about the, the Green New Deal and particularly about the, um, the, the, the objective of moving towards something like self-sufficiency or a, a stronger regionalization of productive activities, um, I think you know, international coordination, international cooperation uh, is really pivotal to set up an international framework that does not um, leave less developed countries uh, behind. Given the intense um, integration of the global economy via global value chains and the dependent development trajectories of many countries in the global south, I think um, you need much stronger international cooperation and coordination mechanisms across a wide array of policy fields. Um, I think the, the UNCTA Geneva principles um, that were presented last year give some guidance in that respect, but need further elaboration. Um, so I think the international dimension of any Green New Deal proposal needs to be much more elaborated as it currently stands. Uh, that is true, I would argue, for Anne's conception. It is particularly true for the Euro European Green, De Green Deal, but it is also true for the uh, democratic proposals uh, in the United States of Ocasio-Cortez and Elizabeth Warren um, and others. So um, I would think that um, the, the Green New Deal is something that deserves um, a thorough discussion but needs to be expanded in certain aspects and I'm happy to discuss that with you um, later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Matthias Weber. Yes, thank you very much, first of all, for a very inspiring talk and a very provocative uh, book. 
Um, I share very much of, of, the, of the problem analysis that is made in the book, in particular also the emphasis that is put on the importance of structural change uh, of, um, as, a, as a trigger for the transformations ahead. Also because uh, I think in the past years, also within the uh, sustainability and distance research network, um, the kind of structural and maybe also the kind of uh, landscape development such as those of a global financial system have not been so much in the focus of, of, of research. I think that's an important point to take into account. I also think that the uh, perspective that the role of the financial system um, as a servant rather than as a master of economy and society is an important message uh, from your presentation uh, and your book. And um, that um, this is really one of the key triggers for then another of many of the other um, bottom up uh, emergent processes of innovation that need to take place in order to uh, create new solutions within such a new framework. Now, uh, there's one point where um, I'm a bit hesitant as regards your problem analysis because I think the analysis of the relationship between the state and uh, the, uh, let's say, the, the, the private sector is very much based on the kind of uh, Anglo-Saxon experiences in the US and the UK. And I've been asking myself whether the same uh, um, analysis applies also to more the continental European countries. But in fact, um, over the past uh, decades, we have seen that the state has, of course, also um, been subject to the conditions of the global financial markets. Uh, but many of the countries have maintained a quite uh, strong role of the state. The state has not given up control, I would say. There are countries where we have very strong local authorities, for instance, that have uh, quite a lot of influence on uh, public investments and are able to steer quite a lot of those investments in a uh, more sustainable direction. So that's an issue uh, regarding the lessons that we can learn from uh, the analysis of the state, the US and, and the UK, which in some cases may only be um, transferred to continental Europe uh, with, a, with a grain of salt. Uh, second my main point that I find very important in this context relates more to politics. Uh, the Green New Deal presupposes um, a kind of model of government with a very well-functioning and transparent political system where the people in charge uh, act in the interest uh, of the people and the citizens. Um, even in some of the European countries, this cannot really fully be taken for granted, I think. And uh, so um, there is a bit of hesitance how much responsibility we can really um, put on, uh, on the state as um, managing and steering and governing uh, this transformation process ahead of us. I think we need to be aware of those limitations. We need to be clear that um, the abilities of the state are limited. And it was actually um, one of the reasons why we saw this growing interest in neoliberalism that in the 1970s, for instance, there was a bit of um, disappointment with the, if you like, the, the, the track record and the performance of the state as a very proactive shaper of, uh, of, the, of social and technological change as well. So the track record is mixed. We have learned, of course, a lot over the past 40 years. Um, but we should keep the lesson uh, of the past nevertheless in mind. Um, finally, um, a brief word that has already been picked up by uh, Werner Ratzer. This has to do with the question of um, how do you ensure the public support to such a kind of um, demanding program like a Green New Deal. And this is why I think that it is very important not only to stress the ecological but also the social dimension of uh, the Green New Deal, because this is, I think, for many citizens, the argument that could uh, tip the balance in favor of uh, a Green New Deal policy and program, in particular, also here in the European context. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Anne Pettifor, would you please reply to these three statements before we... Um, start with all the questions that are flying in through diverse social channels. 
Right, thank you ever so much. And those were really very helpful comments. And also, you're quite right to point to the limitations of my presentation and indeed of the idea, the Green New Deal. Can I say the Green New Deal has given us a framework within which to talk about transformation, which includes the economy. Before changing the environment, tackling climate change was all about that silo, which is the environment, mm -hmm. and not about this silo, which is the economy. So we now have something where, now we're underneath that umbrella, there are many, many gaps and many, many flaws. But at least we have something that I think can bring us together. Now, Sigrid rightly said, uh, questioned, you know, this thing about markets and that markets are really political and they've been politically constructed. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think this links slightly to what Matthias was saying as well about um, about markets. But the fact of the matter is that our, that throughout history, for 5,000, 6,000 years since ever we've had markets, and it, perhaps even longer than that, society has managed those markets uh, in villages back in the past. You know, no, there was no question that there was the man who, who measured the pint of beer and the and the yard of cloth or the meter of cloth to sure, make sure that the marketer wasn't cheating. We've always regulated the system. For me, what's happened lately is that markets have become, and, and here I'm going to be contradictory, have become detached from society. You know, they effectively operate in the stratosphere without oversight and without regulation. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a big generalization. But having said that, and I have to come back to what Matthias was saying about the role of the state, actually under the system of globalization and deregulation and liberalization, the state has expanded massively. Mm -hmm. The question now is that it's not, it's not expanded to serve the citizen, it's expanded to serve essentially Wall Street. If you look at the role mm -hmm. of the state, in this current crisis pandemic, the role of central banks has become absolutely dominant in the world and the private sector cannot function without it, right? Mm. So what we find now is that actually the private sector has expanded the public sector so that it, you know, it can get more from it, really. I mean, private sectors, uh, entrepreneurs don't want to take risks anymore. They want risk-free free investments. If you look, and I thought what um, Werner was saying about uh, developing low-income countries, you know, investors are saying, we're willing to invest in Africa, but please will the, the governments of the West guarantee all our investments so that we don't make any losses? And can the World Bank and the IMF ensure that we make returns of this rate, please? Nothing less, because otherwise we won't risk it. So, so we find contradictorily that while at the same time mm -hmm. markets of financial markets in particular have become more detached, and I agree with Sigrid, that was political, highly political decision. Mr. Thatcher and Mr. Reagan and President Nixon were very political about freeing up Wall Street once again mm -hmm. and the city of London. But equally, um, and, and the state has expanded as a result of that. So, you know, I, I feel it has to be political. We, but for me, it has to be democratically political, not just mm -hmm. in the interests of, of the few. So um, I think it was Werner who also questioned, you know, it's all very well talking about this, but what, what about the allocation of finance? And I think that's a really important question. Now, um, you know, the question, I, I just, can I say perhaps just by giving a very practical example, and I speak here as, as, a, as a woman who in my youth first applied for a mortgage. And when I applied for a mortgage, I had to go and see the, gov the, the, um, the manager of the bank. And I had to explain to him that I had a way of repaying this mortgage over time. And these were my assets, my education, the fact that I was skilled and I was likely to be employed. And this is my income and this, this is my collateral. Nowadays, that's almost not agreed upon. And in those days, the central banks issued what is called guidance, essentially, to the banks. Thou shalt lend for productive activity and into projects that will uh, generate income and that are, you know, sustainable in some way, that, you know, will be, the, the debt will be repaid. Thou shalt not lend for the purposes of speculation, right? 
those rules, mm -hmm. that regulation was disbanded in the 19, actually long before the 1970s, long before Reagan. So now it is possible to lend money for speculative purposes. And in fact, and this is what Rana Faruha's book is about, that money invested for speculation is far preferable to today's capitalists than money invested for productive activity or sound activity. Mm -hmm. So allocation it really is important, Vern, I agree with you. And the central banks can play a really important part in, in deciding the categories of how, you know, the fact is the banks are licensed and that that license should depend on conditions. Thou shalt have a license, but only if you lend wisely. And I agree also, I think it was Matthias who said that, that the Europeans, the European model is a better and a different one from the Anglo-Saxon model. The Anglo-Saxon model is utterly reckless in the allocation of credit, right? But that's because the central banks have stood away, have said nothing to do with me. If a shadow banking sector wants to emerge, I think that's fine, right? Not we want that banking sector licensed and managed and regulated. So, um, so I think the allocation is incredibly important. And I'm talking about allocation in very broad terms in terms of productive and speculative activity, because that was what the kind of guidance was that bankers, central bankers demanded in the past. But we could, we could make it even more conditional. Society could make it more conditional. Society could say, look, primarily, you know, finance must be available not for fossil fuels, but for renewables. And if you don't like that fossil fuel company, it's tough. Now, this is a very simplistic way of thinking about this when you think about, about the Saudis and the extraction of oil. But we see already that oil is on, on, the, on the brink of becoming a distressed asset. We saw what happened to the oil price in the middle of the pandemic. It went negative, right? So, and we see that there's overproduction of oil, which again is affecting the price. So, um, but what's to stop central banks from saying you are not allowed to deal with the central bank. And I didn't touch on this, but the work that, for example, Daniela Gabor is doing here, and she's a Romanian uh, here in Britain, is about this, of the central bank saying, I'm not willing to provide you with liquidity if in exchange you are offering me a brown asset. You have to offer me a green asset. Now, we know that in Brussels right now, there is a debate around the... Um, about what is brown and what is green. And of course, the fossil fuel companies are in there to say that, you know, fossil fuels are green, right? But when the central bank decides that I will lend for green projects and not for brown projects, that makes a profound difference to the financial sector. It makes a profound difference to where pension fund money goes and where insurance company money goes. And we are arguing for the central banks to play that role. And that comes back. Uh, Werner, to your question about um, allocation. Finally, um, I can't agree more. Um, I, I just want to say to Sigrid, I, you're quite right, I neglected so much about the biosphere and in particular about biodiversity. Um, and I stick with common budgets, uh, which leaves out biodiversity. And passionately, I'm passionate about biodiversity. And but the, the reason is that that is a subject that I'm no, not really a big expert on, and I rely on people like your good self to help flesh that out, as you say. Um, but then I think Matthias was right, and I think Werner also said so, we've got to make this socially and politically attractive. And it, for me, social and economic justice is at the heart of this. For me, if we were to manage the financial sector, we were to manage the rentier nature of the economy, the rent-seeking nature of the economy, uh, we would begin to get uh, social justice. And I argue this because I grew up under the Bretton Woods system. And, and let us say also that this is not, these are not national solutions. These are international solutions. I grew up under the Bretton Woods system where, you know, countries in Africa where I grew up had a degree of self-sufficiency but also had full employment stability, financial and economic stability. Money didn't flood out of Africa in the way that it does today. And that gave Africans much greater economic stability than they had after liberalization. So um, 
I, I believe that an international framework is absolutely fundamental to ensuring and an international framework for carbon budgets as well as for uh, international cooperation around financial resources is absolutely vital for this thing to work. And that's why I, I am essentially arguing for a restoration of Brit Bretton Woods in a new form. Brit Bretton Woods managed flows of capital across borders, managed trade, at least gave countries the ability to manage these things so that they weren't subject to the whims of the market. Um, so I'm, I just want to say I agree with that. I don't know if I, I, I oh, on the question of the state, and, and you're quite right, I think it was Matthias was saying, there's greater disappointment with the state than in Europe. I, I just happened to have uh, to be married to a man who was the Secretary General of the Council of European Municipalities and Regions. And I know full well from him how much more important local authority and local democracy is across Europe, and in particular in countries like Germany and Austria, than it is here where we, in Britain, we have, we've more or less demolished our local government, our local mm -hmm. democracy. Um, so I can't, uh, I, I can't agree with you more that we have to see the role of the state in this much broader sense than the Anglo-Americans do. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're not going to be able to cover all the questions that are coming in here, but I'm going to start with some. I hope everybody's fine with that. Um, Flor Avellino, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, is saying thank you for a great talk. From the perspective of just transitions, could you comment more about how to integrate socioeconomic justice and transnational solidarity into a Green Deal? And then there's another question. Um, surely we need more self-sufficiency and, as you said, low-income countries also deserve more self-sufficiency. However, I have doubts about making our solidarity with other countries entirely or solely dependent on inter- or supranational government policy. In addition to challenging the global economy through more local economic activity, can we imagine a translocal economy that has solidarity built into it through cooperative and commons-based principles. And then I have a third one here, but I don't know who's that, who that's from. We have reached the end of our keynote session now, which will be, no, I don't say that. No, this is, has nothing, sorry. That's just organizational, sorry. Okay, so these two questions, and Petra for please, thank you. Yeah, the thing is, these are very big questions. How to integrate social justice into a Green New Deal? Um, I don't have a simple answer to that question. This is a very big question, um, and I don't want to pretend I have the answer. I do want to argue though, that there were levels of social and economic justice that existed before the 1970s that have not existed since. We have levels of inequality now which are obscene. They are utterly obscene. And for me, they're not a consequence because of us being more evil as people than we were between 1945 and 1970. It's a consequence of the framework within which we work, in which speculation and gambling on money in order to make more money effortlessly is the way to get rich. You know, you're crazy if you, if you want to behave differently. So we, this inequality that we're living under at the moment is just unbelievably obscene and and, and we, we seem to tolerate it. I find it intolerable. I find it intolerable in, where I live in London, where Russian oligarchs are able to come here and spray their money around, buy our politicians, um, uh, gamble, speculate, do as they please, move on uh, regardless of the impact. And they're able to use our public services without paying taxes. You know, these these, these are high levels of injustice. Uh, huge companies like Amazon, Silicon Valley can come to Britain, can make profits and move out and put their profits in Dublin or in other tax havens and, and not pay taxes. And I pay taxes every month and you and everybody else pays taxes. That sense of injustice, that inequality is, in my view, what is fueling the rise of authoritarianism and nationalism and ultimately even fascism, you know. 
uh, Donald Trump, for whatever we may think about him, is responding to a cry of pain from the base about where is my job? Where is the decent income that my family used to earn? That used to, where, you know, why do I pay taxes when, you know, uh, Amazon doesn't pay taxes? That, and, and so give me a strong man that's going to be protecting me from these global market forces, China, whatever. So for me, that's the injustice. We have to end this current system and try and rebuild a more constructive system if we are to integrate social justice into the Green New Deal. And how to build a trans-local economy um, based on the self-sufficiency of countries in the South and the North. I agree with you. We can't trust world leaders. Right now, we certainly can't trust world leaders. But we get the leaders that we want, essentially. We have to change our leaders, which means we need social movements that demand a new kind of political leadership. And of course, those social movements will want to work internationally and cooperatively to solve problems. Um, but I grew up, as I say, in the 1950s, where this kind of uh, international coordination, which we didn't call globalization, we called it international. Uh, existed and where there was relative peace and stability, or relative, of course. But and I can't. I mean, I think this is getting us into big, deep waters, and I'm going too far into that territory for the moment. I have some more questions for you. There's one that's uh, talking about Bretton Woods, as you were talking before. It says, "Why use the parallel to the failed New Deal proposal and not to the Bretton Woods Agreement? Wouldn't the latter financial?" architecture be an appropriate benchmark for what is currently needed. Then I will go on with some more questions if that's okay with you. Dear Anne, thank you for your very instructive lecture, says Jeroen van den Berg. But won't your suggestion to regulate credit, which I support, only control overall quantity of money but not redirect allocation of funds by private and pep public actors to low carbon alternatives. We'd need to assure returns of renewables investment are improving versus fossil fuels, requiring a structural price correction. Favoring low carbon options maximally arguably necessitates some form of carbon pricing. What's your take on this? Well, now two more questions. Why use the failed New Deal and not the Bretton Woods? Well, because the Bretton Woods was a failure. Bretton Woods was a failure for Keynes. It wasn't what he wanted. He didn't want the dollar as the dominant reserve currency for the world. He wanted a clearing agency where people would be treated like you and I are treated by the bank manager, fairly. We, you know, whatever we say to the bank manager, there is a process whereby my checks can be cleared by by, by the bank for you and so on. And this is done in a kind of neutral way, really. Whereas if there is one nation that controls the world's reserve currency, as the United States currently controls the dollar, we get the kind of power imbalances that we're now living under. And Keynes saw that as a huge defeat. Everybody else thought, um, you know, that Bretton Woods was was his idea. It, it very large part it was his idea. Managing capital flows was his idea. Managing trade flows was his. But what he thought was absolutely essential, and this is what he devised in 1919, was the establishment of a of a currency and of a clearing union, if you like, which was in a way neutral and enabled countries to do trade with each other without being subject to the fluctuations of the of the reserve currency massively. And um, I can't go into it in great depth, but that's the difference between what New, uh, Keynes proposed in 1919, what Roosevelt began to embark on, but what ended up as the Bretton Woods system, which was a great disappointment to him. Um, then this question of regulating credit and redirecting, I've, I've touched something there along the lines of the allocation of credit. I want to say this because I, I feel passionately about this for people like us who are activists, right? Which is that the private sector desperately wants public assets. And the most valuable public asset, the safest public asset the private sector can get its hand on, the safest bit of collateral is the debt of OECD countries. 
US Treasury bills, British government debt, European debt, these are, this is the collateral that a bank wants more than anything else. It doesn't, un, it doesn't trust Apple's corporate debt as an asset, but it does trust the US's debt as an asset. Why? Because the United States is backed by 143 million taxpayers, law-abiding taxpayers that pay their taxes every month, every year, and so on. Same applies in Britain. There are 30 million taxpayers. We've got a good sound tax collation system. And as Sigrid said, you know, we have institutions which uphold us, our monetary system, that are financed by public, by taxpayers, by you and I. And I think we need an understanding of our power, of how dependent the private finance sector is on the fact that we want to issue bonds to finance the transformation of the economy. This is giving the finance sector a fantastically valuable asset because we have sound institutions for the repayment of those bonds. That enables us to set some conditions. So I want to be able to say, if you, if you pension fund or if you the insurance company or if you hedge fund or if you the shadow bank want access to Bank of England resources backed by British tax taxpayers, these are the terms and conditions. Thou shalt not use your money for the extraction of fossil fuel. If you don't, if you, I mean, you, you're free to do it in a free world, but you're not free to have uh, uh, access to British public resources, right? Because every central bank's providing publicly backed resources, not privately backed resources. Pub That's why the, the central bank is the lender of last resort. That's why the central banks have been so fundamental to this crisis, right? But but that's us. It's our money. It's our loyal payment of taxes every year that make you know the European um, welfare states sound and and stable and enable them to to function. And the private sector cannot hesitate to get its hand on that. So I, I want us to see ourselves as being in a powerful position in relation to the private finance sector and to begin to say, yeah, we can. We know we have to bail out the system every so often. We're not against bail. I'm not against the bailout of the great financial crisis. I'm not even against support given to the private sector because of the pandemic. But I am in favor of terms and conditions for that support. Currently, they get that support almost unconditionally. Okay, that's the end of that. Thank you very much. I would now like to give you another two questions from the chat and then go into another round of comments from all the panelists. Uh, Matthias Weber, Werner Ratzer and Sigrid Stagl, if that's okay with you. Anne, and then we would try to show you the three-minute cultural piece of Ganymede again. We'll see if that works in around 20 to 25 minutes. So just to give you an orientation here. So here are the two questions. Wait a second, let me find them. Colleen Schneider, thank you for your talk, and You comment at the end of your talk that while money is plentiful, what is missing are plans to direct that money to a climate transition. In the role of power and vested interests in deciding where that money goes, not a more significant factor. So, sorry, I'm not reading this right. And vested interests in deciding where that money goes, not a more significant factor rather than a shortage of plans. And then Dirk Lohrbach, Thank you for the presentation. Isn't policy, however, part of the problem? Public earning model is our linear and fossil consumption. And shouldn't we focus much more on transition of the finance system where social and environmental costs need to be fully integrated? Sure, climate change is a problem and carbon tax seems like a nice, clean economist solution, but Biodiversity loss is infinitely more relevant. So yes, a green deal, but it needs to be based on the commons and a nature positive economy. Yeah. Right. Um, th those two questions have reminded me that I never answered the question about, um, about taxes, carbon taxes. I personally am against carbon taxes. Um, I, uh, I don't think that's the way to go. Um, I'm in... 
I'm in favor of the transformation of whole sectors. We've got to transform the energy sector. We just have to move away from fossil fuels instead of just managing it through the market and through carbon pricing and taxation. I think that's wrong. I also think it's terribly wrong uh, to tax individuals and, and people currently engaged in the current economy. So if you look at what happened in France with the Gilets Jaunes, uh, they were naturally, you know, they, there is no alternative to their system of transport. They work in rural areas, they have a little white van, this is their business, this is what they do, and suddenly the government then hammers them with a tax, whereas the big fossil fuel companies can move their money across borders and not pay taxes. I thought that was terribly unfair, and it's particularly unfair not just because, you know, they don't pay taxes, but because we haven't provided an alternative. So what the state has to do is to intervene to provide an alternative energy system, an alternative transport system, an alternative land use system, and then people can participate and they can play their role and can do the right thing. If you have enough public transport to replace my little white van, great, I'll use it. And so, but, but the state needs to provide that in the first instance. And I think that, um, that addresses this this problem of of the decisions being made by vested interests. Um, I'm quite right. If you just leave this to the self interest, uh, to the invisible hand of the market, then that's what you will get. Um, but in order to enable the the, um, the transition to take place, we need to provide societies with alternatives. Um, uh, and yes, money is plentiful, but it is managed by vested interests. That's why we need the state to take a more progressive role. Um, so I think the next question was policy being part of the problem of the transition and, and the, the costs and the biodiversity loss and not incorporating that into the costs. That's why I'm, I'm saying I, I don't think carbon taxes can do that. They can't, they can't make that evaluation. I think we need far more radical change than that. Uh, and then going around measuring the costs of what it what it means to lose, you know, the wonderful curlew, my local bird that's on the red list here in London, in Britain. Um, rather, we should be providing alternative uses of land to make it possible for the curlew to survive. So I, I want us to think big in those terms. And you know, I I thought. I still think that there's an awful lot about my work and the Green New Deal work, which is kind of utopian, really, and which can be dismissed as utopian. But I tell you, I learned that if we don't have these ideas and we don't have these hopes and these aspirations, when the moment comes, we're not ready. Right? We won't be there with our demand. When the moment the pandemic came, what was extraordinary about the pandemic? And let me just comment to this on the moment, you know. We believed the world was full of selfish, greedy people that wanted to do nothing more than consume. And suddenly, in my world, there was a world full of people who wanted to work together, who wanted to work cooperatively, who wanted to care for the sick and the elderly, and who came together spontaneously in Britain without the help of the state, without the help of local government virtually, and organized collectively in their communities. I mean, there was an extraordinary spirit that came through when I'd given up on that hope that people would be like that. Um, and also, we, we didn't consume. It turned out that we... And then the point that Seagreed made was that we suddenly had key workers and key industries. From where? How? And we discovered, and the joy of the pandemic was, we discovered that footballers that are paid millions of pounds a week to play football were irrelevant to the economy. Oligarchs were irrelevant to this crisis. The people who were relevant were shelf stackers in supermarkets, nurses, cleaners. Those are the people we couldn't do without. But what do we do? We undervalue. We don't value their work. And their work often uh, emits less greenhouse gas than does you know, the work of, of the rich. So. So we saw just within this little uh, this bubble that we lived in for a while, and who knows what the lasting impact of it will be, but we saw it possible there to behave and live differently and to, to organize differently and to define differently. And the thing that most excites me is that we learned 
that it's not the oligarchs who make the economy. It's not the footballers. It's not the rich people. It's us, you know. It's the shelf stackers, the workers, the cleaners, the nurses, the doctors, without whom we wouldn't have survived. And people cottoned on to that very, very quickly and understood that. Now, have we got the political leadership and the political clout to take that forward? I'm very doubtful at the moment. But but that what it showed us is that the spirit is there. I'll stop at that, if that's okay. Thank you very much. I'll do the other way around now. So Matthias Weber goes first, please. Yes, uh, I think these were, this was an inspiring discussion and I just would like to stress two points that for me were really important takeaways from, from that discussion. The first one is this strong emphasis put um, in the answer of uh, and Patty for on the importance of tying conditions to the collaterals that are provided by the public, uh, the public sector. Because this is really a very strong leverage uh, for um, ensuring that um, direction or directionality can be imposed on the subsequent investment and the use that is made of that money. I think this is really something that we should take up and keep on keep in mind and also keep in the discussions about the European Green Deal. The second point that I really would like to keep as a, as a takeaway is uh, the, stressing the importance of providing uh, alternatives. And I think this is also very much where uh, innovation strategies and innovation policy comes into play. Because um, let's say the basic function of uh, research and innovation policy is actually to create and generate a variety of alternatives and make them, if you like, sufficiently strong and viable so that they can play a more significant role in society in providing um, public services, for instance. Um, you referred, Anne, to the example of uh, transport and mobility, and this is, of course, a very good example, but you could expand that equally to several other areas. Mm. And in fact, this is one of the domains um, on which the community at this, at this conference has been working on for, for, for quite a few years, mm. how these kind of new uh, inroads, new solutions can be brought to bear more widely in society. And so combining uh, these experiences, I think this is, these are really two very important takeaways from, from this discussion. I think. Thank you very much, Werner Ratzer. Well, uh, thank you also for the quite interesting discussion. Uh, perhaps I'd like to, um, to refer back to the one question on how to organize transnational solidarity, because I think that is, as I already mentioned, one of the um, underdeveloped parts of the, 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 the Green New Deal discussions. Um, I think in the current system, which Danny Roderick has aptly described as hyper-globalization, uh, organizing transnational and particularly in international solidarity is very difficult, uh, if not impossible, simply because uh, new international transnational actors like uh, banks, financial institutions, but also transnational corporations have put nation states into competition with each other via a process called locational competition, where nation states compete yeah. for capital and, and investment in their economies by offering tax incentives um, and, and many other kind of infrastructural services. So nation states compete with each other in the economic field, while at the same time, on the political level, they are supposed to cooperate. And I think the change that we've seen over the last 40 years has, has made it much more difficult for the international system to promote forms of cooperation, given the increasing um, competitional pressure. So what we need, um, and that is why I um, agree with Anne in terms of um, deglobalization, is a certain disintegration of global economic and financial circuits uh, as a precondition for you know, creating an environment where cooperation between states uh, can prosper. So I think in that sense, uh, a first and, and crucial step for promoting transnational solidarity is to kind of deglobalize to some extent at least the current form of economic integration um, and then um, promote cooperation on issues such as taxation, health policies, environmental policies, etc. But I think in the current system, the, the conflict between economic cooperation, uh, economic competition, yeah. 
yeah. and political cooperation um, has led to a situation that it has almost almost resulted in a breakdown of multilateral cooperation and and as we also see um, the rise of geopolitical rivalry. So I think um, economic disintegration, to some extent at least, is a precondition for economic uh, for for political cooperation. Uh, and again, political cooperation is what we need in terms of promoting a Green New Deal also on the global level. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, two points um, to the end. Um, on the one hand, um, Anne talked about the coercion that is uh, exerted by the system on uh, workers and, uh, uh, and, and consumers. And uh, I think this is where the reframing that's necessary in, in economics is, uh, becomes so clear that uh, the choice between leisure and working time is, is perceived as a choice. Well, it's not really a choice. Um, or uh, the choice between a bundle of consumer products. Um, and I, I think we really need to move away from, from this idea of, uh, of choice uh, towards uh, structural change that can really allow us to, um, to have our, be uh, our needs fulfilled and to, to lead fulfilling lives, fulfilled lives. Uh, so I think that is a complete reframing uh, that is necessary in, in the thinking about the economy and I agree with, with Anne, it, it's important to move along there fast uh, because um, well we are in a crisis and the next crisis and this is my second point, um, of course we, we are in the midst of them already and uh, I think this is where we, 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 sh we shall remember of how political leaders react, how they act uh, when they perceive uh, a situation to be a crisis. Uh, the COVID-19 is a shock crisis, mm -hmm. uh, but we've been in a latent biophysical crisis that arose from the biophysical side for, for decades. And it, it's just not been accepted as a crisis situation. I think we shall remember what's, what we should expect of political leaders um, and that you should uh, accept that uh, from the biophysical sphere, uh, the, the, the crisis situation that are arising or at least they're stark and, of course, stronger and longer lasting uh, than the COVID-19. So that's, I think, a takeaway of in terms of our expectations uh, towards the political system. Thank you so much for your uh, very inspiring talk again. Thank you. Thank you all very much. There is uh, one more, not a question, but actually very many of you um, wrote something very similar, and I'd like to read that out, one example out of many, saying, thank you, Anne. I hope you can feel the rounds of applause that would have been heard were we all in the same room here in Vienna. Wow, thank you very much. I wish I had, I wish I was there. <laughs> very much. I well, send my solidarity to you all. Thank you very much. So, and since we miss you all here in Vienna, we'll try again to um, show the video of the Ganymede Kunsthistorische Museum session that was prepared for us. And I want to apologize to the organizers because I think my firewall rejected the, the, the framework and so I made life very difficult for the organizers at the beginning so I want to thank them for sorting in particular Max for sorting it out. Okay they're smiling and the, all the thumbs are up here. <laughs> Good. <laughs>